Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, October 15th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, as usual, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a registered investment advisor. I cannot give you individual tailored investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So I wanted to get into what I think is coming to a head, and that's oil prices. Uh, and what I mean by that is I think sufficient things are starting to happen in the energy markets. We've been talking about it for several years, but I think that we are moving to a situation where we're going to see prices start moving higher into the end of the year and uh, into next year and to the point where I think that will be the, the thing that really throttles the economy. And why am I saying that? Well, as you know, we've been talking about uh, the lack of investment, the ESG mandates, the general lack and malaise among producers of energy here in the U.S., i.e., you know, your exploration production companies, how they've been lambasted and demonized the media and just the general zeitgeist against hydrocarbons. And so, you know, what we see now is the energy transition isn't going to happen in, before the election. And so we have this current administration, um, you know, being basically shown to be the clown car that it is. And, uh, you know, that's not specific to them. They just happen to, be in, happen to be in power when this is happening. But previous administrations have not had energy policies either, not had rational energy policy for this country that says this is what you need. The, the, the conversations that we have on here about the energy inputs that required for the civilization and the standard of living we want, and then how do we get there? Because we don't treat people like adults because in a two and four year election cycle, that's not possible. You're not going to get elected like that. So what we have is um, people coming into power, whether they're on the, you know, pro energy or, or against hydrocarbons or whatever. And we have constituencies and people that are, you know, giving money, supporters, lobbyists, whatever. And so they have to be placated. So when the Biden administration comes into power, you know, he's the guy that stood in front of that 14 year old girl and said, you know, look in my eyes. You know, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels. Do you believe me? I mean, so this is, you know, they tell you what they're going to do. So you should believe them. So that doesn't mean it's going to work, though. So what we have is a situation where um, these distortions in the market, because, you know, most of the world runs on, and specifically the U.S., on hydrocarbons. So if you limit them, you start causing distortions in the economy. You start causing distortions in price signals uh, because you're trying to uh, force something uh, into the market that the market doesn't want. And so it causes a distortion. And so the, we've talked about this before. So here we have a situation where, you know, we have this relationship with the Saudis for 50 or 60 years. And then we have this statement by the Saudis basically where, you know, they basically say the U.S. tried to tried to get OPEC to hold off on these quota cuts until after the midterm elections. And so everything's politicized. And when everything's politicized, you know, as Doomberg has said, and we're going to crib that statement again, you know, we have these little statements that we use here to keep it simple for people. When physics meets politics, physics wins. And that's the problem, right? Um, there's not enough energy inputs going into the system now because of all the things that we've done intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, which are causing, you know, uh, these shortages, which we've talked about ad nauseum. And so we have a situation here where the Saudis basically say, you know, um, the statements issued about the kingdom following the OPEC plus decision announced on October 5th, which have described the decision as the kingdom taking sides in international conflicts and that it was politically motivated against the United States. They express their total rejection of these statements, and they are not based on facts. 
And then we have over here, these are snippets from the statement. You can go out and find it, read it yourself. The government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia would also like to clarify that based on its belief in the importance of dialogue and exchange of views with its allies and partners outside the OPEC Plus group regarding the situation in the oil markets, the government of the kingdom clarified through its continuous consultation with the U.S. administration that all economic analysis indicate that postponing the OPEC Plus decision for a month according to what has been suggested would have had negative economic consequences. So they're basically saying that the United States government was lobbying them behind the scenes not to do this because they don't want anything that, to disrupt what's looking not very good for them in the midterms, them being the administration and the Democratic Party. And so this is what we're reduced to because we have no energy policy. We're running around, um, you know, uh, trying to get the Saudis to get OPEC to not, you know, do this quota cut after the election um, and then accusing them publicly of siding with Russia. And now we have people in the Senate, in the Congress wanting to pass legislation. Somebody's got to do something. We're not going to sell them anymore. You know, overpriced hardware, military hardware. Um, we're just going to do, you know, this is just damaging, right? Uh, to push them further towards the, you know, what I call that multipolar world, which I think that's where they want to go anyways. So this is terrific. This is really working out really well. You know, we go back, you know, I say that sarcastically, but going back to what we said before, we're not policymakers here. In a perfect world, if I was king for a day, it's not even worth talking about because it won't happen. This politi political situation around energy has always been there. It always will be there. And there's too many constituencies, too many lobbyists, too much money at stake. And so, you know, in a two and four year election cycle, you're not going to, you know, you need to sit down and have a real policy and a real discussion with people um, about uh, um, about what it takes to power a society that we want to live in but you know no one wants to do that because you know that's not really how things work so i thought this was interesting and you can believe it if you want you can not believe it you know but you know they've got a real problem and this is just one of the you know it's coming to a head now you know we don't really have allies we have countries have interests they don't have allies and if the saudis realize that you know what do we need to i like i've said before i've never seen such a response to an American president administration by the Saudis. I mean, it's it's a whole new world is what it is. And so, you know, this is I think they've made it clear that uh, even if the, they they are going to there's an OPEC put out there, if you will, they will continue to cut production. Um, if if demand goes down, they want to defend the oil price. And I think that's bullish. It's, especially in the context of some of the other bullish things that are that are happening. And so, you know, here is another thing uh, that's going on. Uh, it looks like, you know, somebody in the administration finally woke up that and realized that price caps, well, at least the Bloomberg uh, um, headline here is may backfire. And so, yes, they will backfire. If you took, you know, in your core courses in university, macro and microeconomics, you know that if I mandate that tomatoes should be sold for two cents a piece, there won't be any tomatoes because the producers can't produce them uh, for less than two cents. Therefore, they cannot make a profit. Okay, so there will be no tomatoes. The same thing will happen with oil. You cannot mandate in a fungible market, worldwide market for oil, the, uh, as a huge consumer of oil, what the price is going to be. It's just not how things work. And so it highlighted part from the article here. Some Biden administration officials are growing concerned that their plan to cap the oil price, the price of oil purchased from Russia may backfire, according to people familiar with the matter. Well, the Russians have been clear that any country that engages in this, they will not sell oil to them. OK, so, you know, you can go down the list, I guess, and figure out who's buying Russian oil right now and what 
that means if they cut a million, two million, three million barrels a day in a world market that's you know probably you know undersupplied right now. Um, the oil price will probably go to 150 or 200 dollars a barrel. You know, this is within the context of declining Russian production, anyways, because the lack of invest. You know, this war has been going on; these sanctions and stuff for seven, eight months now. And you remember, uh, without the technological help that they were getting from Schlumberger and Halliburton and Baker Hughes, how are they going to maintain production? So, anyway, so you have all these things happening, right? It, that are that are constraining the oil supply uh and uh then alienating you know uh folks that we've been talking to for 50 or 60 years because you have a midterm election coming up i mean this talk about burning the or eating your seed corn or burning the house furniture to stay warm i don't know this doesn't look like professional real politic to me so one of the things that you know i talked about uh, I think one of the first interviews I did was Malcolm Rawlingson. You know, we talked about long-term viewers will re remember him, remember the conversation we had in the first of the interview series about energy, about ESG, about the energy transition. Um, and one of the things we discussed was, you know, what would turn people off to this? Because we knew from a physics perspective, it wasn't going to work. Uh, it, you cannot run modern societies off intermittent power sources. Uh, it's not even debatable. If you want to debate that with me, I'm not going to do it because you're an idiot. I don't talk to stupid people. Uh, it's not possible. And so it won't happen. And so now it's starting to be realized is what's happening, just like we thought. Because what would happen is people have to get a hit upside the head and they have to feel real economic pain before they would change. Because most people, like I've said, they just have an assumption that they go to the grocery store and food is there. They just have an assumption they turn the light switch on and the lights come on. They don't really have any knowledge or understanding of how these things work, nor should they. I'm not saying the average person should. The average person doesn't speak Chinese. Why? They have no need to. They have no need to understand these things. But the problem is, is that you know, people, you know, don't understand this and but they're starting to get the inkling because now they're feeling the actual pain and now they're forced to look at it and so jamie Dimon, you know who is the uh one of the masters of the universe the ceo of jp morgan you know i showed the video i believe or talked about it a couple of weeks ago when this horrible woman that's the congress person from michigan this rashid rashida talib person um was had all the bankers at a at a uh i don't know congressional hearing it was going down the line like they were little kids saying will you uh, uh here in front of everybody say that your bank will no longer engage in in doing loans for fossil fuel investment and i think jamie diamond was the first one and he said you know no we're not going to do that and that would be like hell on earth in a, if we did that that's exactly what he said. And so he's went on further and made some further comments, I think, you know, as this thing goes on, because these bankers realize this is ridiculous. We're not going to be able to make any money on this, whether or not they're motivated, always motivated by making money, of course. But they realize, you know, this is stupid. This isn't going to work. We're not. And they see that, you know, uh, hydrocarbons aren't going away and it's trillions of dollars of investment. They want to be they want to have their fingers in it. So. Uh, he made some uh, interesting comments, which I'll paraphrase. There's a lot of swear words he used. Uh, seems to be this kind of person. Uh, these comments weren't necessary. This is on Zero Hedge. I'll put a link to the article. It says here, uh, Diamond made some extremely outspoken comments, which, however, you won't hear on the mainstream media. Telling a small group of listeners that was close to the press that, quote, President of the United States needs to stand up and say, we may not meet our 2050 climate objectives because this is an effing war, unquote. He also said, quote, time to stop going hat in hand to Venezuela and Saudi and start pumping more oil and gas in the U.S., unquote. Uh, he must be listening to the weekly videos here. We've been saying that for a while. Uh, he goes on to say uh, another quote here um, or snippet from the article. And he did say when it comes to ESG, quote, Investors don't give a shit, unquote. Of, of course, can't make any money on it. That's the problem. I mean, we've been saying this. There's so many people now getting into renewables that 
the returns are getting very, very low. And yet the construction costs, the operating costs are up, but the what's what these people are willing to pay has gone down. Now that may change. I, I don't have the ability or even want to try to analyze the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, the SOP that this is for this stuff. But the long story short is um, the money's going to be in oil and gas and coal and thing in nuclear because this is realistic and there's going to be a, a tremendous opportunity. So these banks want to get in on it. And he did say when it comes to ESG, quote, investors don't give a shit, warning not to, quote, seed governance to do-gooder kids on a committee, unquote. Well, there you have it. Like I said, he must be listening to the, this isn't hard. Everybody's going to come to this realization eventually, or most people. I mean, there will always be a hardcore 25 or 30% of the people that are never, that are true believers. They believe that you can run the world on unicorn, gat, farts, and good, you know, and thinking positively, because uh, that's what works in their world, in their fantasy world. Uh, in the real world, where men and women, uh, technicians and roughnecks and engineers, construction workers and operations personnel have to 365, seven days a week, 24-7, man these facilities and, so you can enjoy the convenience of going to the light switch, flipping it and it coming on. And like I said, people are starting to come to this realization. And this is something that Malcolm and I talked about probably three years ago. It's starting to happen. And that's why, you know, I apologize for all the swear words that, you know, he used in repeating them, but people are coming to the realization now. And the average person is now, you, the marches are happening in Europe. Okay. They just don't show you in the mainstream media. If you go to alternative media, people in Germany, people in France, people all over Europe uh, are saying, wait a minute, uh, what is really going on here? So here's Javier Blas, a guy we like to follow on Twitter. I suggest you follow him also. Puts out a lot of good information. Um, what's he basically saying here? Well, he's saying that the EIA came out and has made big adjustments to U.S. oil production growth in 2023 and 2022, basically taking it down 40% from what they said back in June. So the panacea, the savior of the lack of supply of oil is not going to be the United States. And there's another fantasy out there that, you know, like Diamond said in his thing, well, we'll just, you know, we need to come back to the U.S. and drill. Yes, there's still quite a bit of reserves in the U.S., but, you know, we've been living off this shale uh, bonanza for the last 10 years, and a lot of the tier one assets have gone away. Now, I will grant you economically, if the oil price goes to 100 150 $200 a barrel, Yes, it makes a lot of marginal fields, marginal projects, uh, you know, profitable. But people aren't going to just drill for oil, you know, if it's not profitable. And, of course, you always pick and work on the easiest projects first. And they have been done. And so I'm not convinced that, you know, we're going to have this big rush back into the oil patch. Not only that. Even if oil went to $150 a barrel next week, I don't think they're going to run out and start dr going crazy drilling. First of all, the equipment's not there. The drill pipe's not there. The sand's not there. The people aren't there. Uh, not only that, why would you do that? Because anyways, because you can't trust this, this administration. You can't trust the government. Okay? They'll, they'll double clutch you every time. And so you're actually, in order for things to change here, because... You know, we've talked about this, and I'm going to show another slide, the, you know, canceling leases. This administration has approved the least amount of leases, like, ever. So they talk out of both sides of the mouth. No one's going to go commit capital until there's real legislation, a real commitment, and some guarantees made, okay? People are not going to go out and put their lively – again, I'm the CEO of the, one of these companies. Why, am, why do I got to go out and do a 5 or $10 billion project in the Gulf of Mexico? with a crazy uh, uh, administration that I can't trust. Then on one hand is telling me to drill for more oil and gas, and on the other hand is doing what they can to keep me from doing that. I'm not going to do that, especially in the zeitgeist that we're in now, which is just do maintenance capital or high return short cycle projects, and your board is happy. The board's happy. I'm happy. The investors are happy because they're getting cash back. 
what's not to like? You know, my so-called duty to the United States. Look, man, people pursue their own self-interest. Again, you got to, you know, take that into consideration. There's no heroes out there. Wanted to point this out. This is uh, somebody you should follow also on Twitter, HFI Research. They're also on Seeking Alpha. They write a lot of great articles. I like these charts that they put together. Uh, this is your product storage here in the U.S. for gasoline, distillate, and jet fuel. Uh, distillates being like heating oil and diesel. Uh, look where we're at, folks. Do you, do you get what's going on here? Um, we're at like below the five-year average for like diesel, for example. Um, what does that tell you? Uh, yeah, the country might be entering a recession, but the demand is high and product storage is low. So what's that tell you? You know, right now we're currently in a turnaround season with quite a few refineries because uh, we're in a shoulder season. We'll start coming out of that and the crude draw should pick up as the price signals and with diesel, you know, well over $5 a gallon, but I, even here in Texas, I saw at some truck stops. Okay, and uh, so the price signal has produced more distillates. And you can see, you know, just based on the previous years, this, this is shocking. And it's not like, you know, bottoming out. It appears to be continuing to decline. And we're just now going to be entering very soon now the heating oil season in the Northeast. Remember, we don't have a lot of natural gas pipelines in the Northeast because of NIMBYism and banana, uh, you know, you know, NIMBY is not in my backyard and banana is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. So, you know, uh, heating oil is the, what they rely on and that demand starts to kick in. And so these price signals are going to tell these refiners, which are already running like in the mid nineties percentile utilization, um, you know, this is why tankers are doing so well too. This discombobulation in these product markets where you're having to ship stuff all over the world and try to make up these, these uh, deficits around the world. You know, France, they're having a big refinery strike. It's almost a month long now. And uh, they're having fuel shortages over there. Okay. And so this is what we're seeing, this manifestation of all of these things. You know, when it rains, it pours, right? So... <clears throat> Expect more crude draws to happen when these refineries come back on as they try to, you know, quench this demand. And so here we go, right? U.S. seeks to, this is October 12th. U.S. seeks to ban, seeks ban on new drilling in central Colorado. President Joe Biden's administration is pursuing a two-decade ban on new oil and gas leasing on 225,000 acres of federal land in a mountainous region in central Colorado. So I'm not going to read through this. Um, of course, the oil and gas industry says that they say here it's misguided and would restrict drilling on a certain shale thing. Uh, of course, the administration, uh, you know, for whatever reason, preserving nature, whatever they're trying to do, restrict oil and gas, I don't know. But this is why people are not going to be, even if oil prices go up, they're not going to run out and start drilling because this is what you have. You have an administration that really hasn't articulated a sane policy to the majority of the people in these industries. And so they're just going to sit back and wait because these guys are going to be out of there. It's going to be one term, okay? Because before this term is over, there's a good possibility that oil price is going to make all-time inflation adjusted highs. And these people are not going to survive that, okay? You see the desperation with how they're dealing with the Saudis, running to the Venezuelans, telling Chevron they can restart their production there, trying to get something going with their, just running around, putting their fingers. I mean, it's a clown show. It's a clown show. It's not a policy. And uh, it's not going to work. You know, SPR draws, whatever. This is are all, these are all, you know, just trying to get through the election and BS everybody. It doesn't work. So... This was an article that was on Bloomberg. I couldn't put a link to it because a lot of the Bloomberg stuff is paywalled. Sometimes I can get past the paywall. Sometimes I can't. But anyways, this is goes back to what Diamond was saying. He's not the only, JP Morgan's not the only bank. It says, for some bankers, net zero is like a New Year's resolution, a pledge one makes and often breaks before a year has passed. Several of the largest banks, including JP Morgan, which we discussed earlier, 
Bank of America and Morgan Stanley headed into the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, as members of the world's biggest zero carbon finance club. By September, they were among a faction ready to quit, <laughs> according to sources familiar with the matter. JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley declined to comment. Well, Mr. Diamond commented this week. Uh, you heard his comments. A year on from COP26, some big banks seem worried they jumped on the bandwagon too soon, especially as oil and gas companies have experienced a market resurgence. So there you have it. Um, and these guys are the ones that make the policies or help make policies, okay? And so I chuckle because we predicted this would happen. And the problem is, is it's not me, guys. I, I, I'm going to make money on this, okay? It's not bragging. This is this was all we we foresaw this. It's happening. If you're invested in the portfolio, you know that we've completely outperformed the S and P over the last couple few years, uh, and we've been the beneficiary of the rise and taking advantage of you know the fact that energy prices are higher. But the average person on the street that doesn't have an investment portfolio, the single mother, waitress, the you know house cleaner that has a bricklayer husband, you know. And they're making thirty-eight thousand dollars a year between them. They can't afford all this, okay? And like we've said, it's not just the gas to get to work; it's every product and service because energy permeates everything. Even if you're a lawyer, if you have a legal uh, business or accounting, you're sending FedEx out stuff. That prices have went up because of fuel surcharges. I mean, everything is a derivative of energy, and so. You know, it's not just about investing, it's real people's lives. And this is why I think that, you know, like I said earlier, when Malcolm and I talked about this several years ago, that it was going to be, people are going to have to get smacked upside the head and finally force themselves going, why is gasoline so high? Why is my power bill up? You know, I had to laugh. These people, because it's a political season, call me. And try to pull me and I reverse the tables. If I feel bored, I amuse myself by flipping this things. And it's like, well, you need to vote against, you know, the current governor and vet for Beto O'Rourke. Are you going to do that? Here's why you should do that. Well, why should I do that? Well, power prices are up. Well, power prices are up because natural gas prices are up and they get a pass through. Okay. It's ga gas prices to run all the combined cycle plants in Texas that form a large part of our energy and backstop a lot of the renewables are up from two dollars to six dollars or seven dollars so you're going to get the pass through utility isn't going to pay that it's a pass through to the customer so that's why energy prices are up you should build more nuclear power plants get the base load up with the cheapest power available but that's you know that's not the consideration it, people don't get it okay and so Again, we're not here to make policy. We're not going to fix it. You know, what we have to do is what's really happening. What are the probabilities of certain outcomes based on decisions that are taken by policymakers or doing the dumb stuff that they do? And then how is that going to translate to the market and then take our position and see if it works? But we talked about this. This is going to happen and it's happening. So again, I, I really on this kick of really kicking the legs out from under the stool of the whole, you know, renewable thing, not because whether it works or doesn't, people don't want to, you just don't have the materials. It's, you have material constraints that are going to not allow for these ambitious goals to happen. It's that simple. It's not me saying that. It's the facts. If you actually look at the facts and do the work, you know, there's plenty of people that have done the work. You can go listen to them. They're on YouTube. They're telling you. They show you the math. If you want to go check the math after them, you can do that. Here's a problem. Lithium production cannot be scaled up. This is an article in the Northern Miner. I'll put a link to it. Bank of America analysts forecast demand for the energy metal will grow by 20% on a compound annual basis between 2021 and 2030, from 700,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent last year to 
million tons in 2030. That level of growth will require 50 new mines producing an average of 40,000 tons of lithium carbon equivalent. But there's a problem. Ironically, while it is, it is climate concerns that are driving demand for lithium higher through the EV revolution, environmental issues are also limiting supplies. Lithium production simply can't be scaled up to meet the level of expected future demand without new technology that reduces its environmental impact. Opposition to brine operations is linked largely to competition for water. So without getting into a big dissertation of how these operations work, basically they pump these brines out from reservoir like in the Atacama Desert in Chile where you have it's sunny 364 days out of the year. Uh, they put them in these ponds they evaporate off the liquid and what's left is various salts which happen to contain a certain amount of lithium, boron, all these different salts and minerals, and then they process them. And so they also need water for these processes. And a lot of these places don't have enough water for these, for these processes. Not to mention, you know, again, uh, if you look at like the US Geological Survey, here's the problem a lot of people make. Well, John, if I look at the U.S. Geological Survey, they say there's so many millions of tons of this stuff in the ground. Absolutely. There's plenty of copper. There's plenty of nickel. There's plenty of lithium. The problem is you have to get it out of the ground. OK, and what is entailed in doing that? We've talked about that before, and that's what's going to limit this. Now, the WAG that is listening to this will say, well, I read in a paper on Clean Tech's website that they come up with a new technology that won't require lithium very possible or maybe they'll come up with a like it said in this article a technology that will allow them to process these brines or process these minerals uh cheaper and easier that's all within the realm of possibility but for right now that's not happening okay um and like i've said before you have to really be careful when you read like mit technology magazine and they talk about all this cool stuff that people are doing in these various labs getting it something to happen in the lab when you're not caring about the cost or how it's going to happen and then giving it to the engineers and the business people and saying okay scale this up into a industrial process that can be done and make economic sense that's the problem and so these things cannot happen like they think they're going to happen with the current technologies it's just not going to happen so Again, heads we win, tails we win more. And that's why I like to point these things out. It's not so I can run a victory lap around and go, yeah, I was right. I'm just telling you, this has significant investment uh, implications. And if you get it wrong, you're going to lose money. Uh, here we go. Uh, these governments, again, um, there's not enough LNG. Again, we're a shortage of molecules, folks. And so... Japan, which imports virtually all of its energy and, you know, is in the process of restarting all of its nuclear reactors or trying to speed it up the restarts. We've talked about that because it can't get the LNG. You know, LNG prices are so high now, it would be equivalent, you know, we're like six and a half bucks an MCF here in the U.S. right now, something like this. Europeans and people in Asia are paying 35, 40 bucks an MCF. Imagine what your electric bill would be in your 2,800 foot, 3,200 square foot McMansion out in the suburbs in August when you're running the AC and your electricity cost was four to five times higher. Can you imagine? Because this is what goes on in other countries. And so with the lack, what happens with a lot of these LNG cargos, people are bidding for them in the spot market. And a lot of the utilities cannot pay there's been a lot of issues in these markets, okay? And you have a situation where, you know, you had the Germans today, I saw it in uh, an article in the EU, they've almost got their storage filled. Yeah, because they completely outbid the rest of the world for the LNG cargoes. Can they do that indefinitely? How? Not as they're destroying their industrial base. Where does the wealth come from to pay for this energy? You just can't print euros forever. Well, you can for some period of time until they become worthless, and that's kind of what's happening, beginning to happen with the euro and the Japanese yen. But anyways, let's get back to this article. 
The Japanese government plans to buy LNG in the event companies can't secure cargoes as the resource scant nation steps up efforts to compete over the scarce fuel. The nation's cabinet approved changes to a law that will allow for the trade minister to order state-owned Japan Oil, Gas and Metals National Corp to procure gas when private firms can't, said the trade minister. The framework will allow, also allow the minister to order large scale gas consumers to restrict usage when supplies are tight. So again, cut back on industrial production and consumption because we have a shortage of gas for heating and those things. And so the government again is now sticking their nose into all of this. And you know this has repercussions for developing markets and emerging markets. They can't, Pakistan, has been bidding on cargoes, cannot get cargoes. We had a big blackout in Bangladesh recently, couldn't get gas. And so you're telling me that there's not going to be an offshore drilling boom for gas? Yes, there will be. There's not enough molecules. This, this is why when we talk about these things, it's not for my health. These are actionable ideas, not in the next week. But we're not here to, and just to clarify this, I'm here as a medium and long-term investor speculator. OK. And you can see what's happening. Not enough molecules for everyone because of the lack of investment and all the other stuff we've talked about over and over and over. And you're seeing it now. Where's Japan going to get the money to do this? Are they just going to print it because they they have tremendous debt there and their currency is going down in value? So that exacerbates a further trend, which has knock on effects. So you just have second, third, fourth, fifth level effects. They all can manifest as opportunities, actionable opportunities. The move comes as global competition over LNG intensifies with Europe seeking to replace Russian pipeline supplies that have been cut off in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine. You know, I think what you're gonna see also, this is going to, I don't wanna to get too far off into this uh, because I, I've, I've given this a lot of thought, you know, this multilateral world It'd be very easy for Russia, which has these resources, people say, well, you know, we're going to punish them. Why not? You could be talking to Pakistan and Bangladesh and say, look, guys, we understand what the West has done. You see what they've done. They've priced you out. They don't care about your population. They don't care that they can just print money and steal. Well, I'll use the word steal, but outbid you for these cargoes, for the scant resource that you need to develop, that you need. You don't think that they would be open? okay, maybe you charge them a higher, you know, you lock into a long-term contract that is beneficial for both parties. You then create a political uh, connection, if you will. You see how you can use resources politically and uh, geopolitically? You know, the ability of these governments, like, you know, might decry the autocracy, the, the autocrat Putin and Xi, but they have the ability to make long-term decisions. Whether that's good or bad is debatable. That's all dis another discussion. But you can, Putin can tell Gazprom, or not just Putin, the Russian government can tell Gazprom to negotiate because they want to create a relationship with the country, okay? That's part of that multilateralism. That's what you do in real politics. You don't go around abusing your partners. You find mutually beneficial ways of doing it you don't just run around uh like you know big dick and everybody like the u.s does you got a 50 or 60 year relationship with the saudis and now they're trying to pass legislation in the congress and the senate uh because you know they're not doing what you know the president wants them to do this particular moment we're going to do that we're not going to allow them to buy airplanes from boeing we're not going to sell them any more defense uh equipment okay they'll buy it from somebody else and so these, this has, like I said, wide ranging. I find it very interesting to try to analyze these things. The average person, this, this is what you have to be thinking about. And remember, base these analysis on self-interest. What's the self-interest of the leadership in Pakistan that can't get LNG? I mean, I would be going to Russia and say, look, we got to get a long-term deal here. How can we do this? Yes, if that means we support you or turn a blind eye or whatever. That's how things work in the real world. It's called real politic. And remember, countries do not have allies. Countries have interests, and interests change continuously. Here we go. Cole keeps the lights on. That's a famous saying in, by Walker Cat in 
West Virginia. If you drive through there, they used to have the signs up. Um, here's generation by technology. You see China and India, the majority of their generation is coal. Okay. You see the Europe and USA, not so much. Okay. Um, I think this renewables thing is probably everything, solar, wind, uh, hydro, all that stuff lumped in. But I, I just, I think one of the biggest calls that we've made over the last couple of years, which I really think is starting to pay off, is the call that coal, thermal coal for electricity and heat production is not going away. It's actually growing. And I, it's the perfect setup. It's almost like if you have existing assets, uh, you have a certain moat. Now that's mostly in the West uh, with coal companies, but in the, in the emerging markets, they're going to they're going to finance and build new coal mines. They have no choice. Again, when politics meets physics, physics wins. Okay, because if you can't, you know, the the the, the deal that a lot of these governments that aren't necessarily democracies make with their people is. We will not challenge you politically. We will not have demonstrations. We will not go for democracy or whatever. But the trade-off is you need to provide us with an increasing standard of living. That's that's been the that's been the compact in China. Okay. Now this isn't necessarily the same everywhere, but that's what it is. So people are going to do what they got to do. Again, people are going to do what's in their own self-interest. And burning coal is very easy to do stuff is available it's easy to transport it's easy to store uh the plants do not take long to build we know how to burn coal efficiently and very cleanly uh, there's various technologies you can put on the back end to clean it clean up the emissions i don't personally believe co2 is a pollutant so you know that's beside the point but that's another conversation but i just want to point this out it's not going away and i I think it represents a tremendous opportunity over the next couple few years when it gets recognized. Again, um, why hydrocarbons aren't going away? We've talked about this. This is more like part of that higher level thinking philosophical. You know, 2014 to 2022, uh, India went from 70 to, they doubled the amount of airports, okay? In the next four years, they're going to build 80 more airports, okay? This comment is perfect. Emerging markets want what the developed world has, and their accelerating growth phase will be fueled by rapidly rising oil consumption. The question is, does the oil, is the oil going to be there? And my suggestion is not because of all the reasons we've talked to. You know, ergo, we're going to have a tremendous bull market in oil. So I wanted to talk about some of the clown world stuff. Uh, this, I don't normally bring this stuff in, but some of the stuff is so egregious, I couldn't help myself this week. Um, this is Banana Republic stuff. Uh, this is an uh, investigation by the Wall Street Journal. This isn't some blog or whatever making allegations. This is a Wall Street Journal. Thousands of officials across the executive branch, one in five, that's 20%, reported owning or trading stocks that they that stood to rise or fall with decisions their agencies made. 31,000 disclosures for 12,000 officials across 50 agencies. Now, this isn't just, I'm not bagging on Biden's, they're all like this. The Congress, why is it taking so long for Congress to pass a law saying you can't trade stocks like Nancy Pelosi does and many, many others? I'm, I'm not even interested. I just read the headlines. I guess I could go through open secrets and figure out who's doing what, but we all know they're crooked. Every single one of these people is crooked. This is banana republic stuff. This is why nothing's going to change. This is why you're not going to vote your way out of this. I keep telling people this. You're just going to re replace one group of scoundrels for another. You know, I thought it was instructive the other day. I found it amusing uh, that uh, this AOC person purports to be a progressive, whatever she is, you know, she's a social media star, uh, mostly based on her little cute looks and stuff. I get it. I, I understand. And she says the right things and she knows how to use social media, but she was giving a town hall and some of these younger people came in there and gave her, gave it to her with both barrels about her support for Ukraine and what's going on, you know, with all the issues that they thought she was a progressive 
they voted for her, they believed in her, blah, 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 blah. The nativity was amazing. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what happens. You go there and you, you are assimilated by the Borg or you do not survive. Yes, you have occasional, um, you have occasional, uh, you know, outliers like Ron Paul. But let me tell you about Ron Paul, because I was a supporter of his. It wasn't, he had a Ron Paul industry, if you will. He had all of his family and friends working in the congressional office back here in like, like, uh, whatever it is down there, uh, down by, uh, I forget what it's called, south of Houston here where his district was. So they're all the same. It's always about money. It's always about power. This is how it's set up, okay? And, you know, as as I saw Milton Friedman say on Donahue one time, where are these angels that you're going to find that are going to reorder society for us? And they don't exist. Again, people pursue their own self-interest. Now, do I think these bureaucrats should be doing that? No, but who's going to change it? Is anybody going to change it? The article comes out. Is anybody shocked? Is anybody outraged? Is there a groundswell? No, it was an article. People just go, well, what do you expect? That's just how it is. Uh, you know, that's how these crooks are, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then everybody forgets about it. That's how, that's how it is. So this is what you see in the end of empires, the end of countries. Everybody's just trying to grab as much as they can because they get a sense that, you know, the, 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 the ground is moving under them, away from them. It's like every man for himself, grab as much as you can before the tap uh, gets turned off. Okay, one more. Uh, this is what I, <laughs> I thought this was amusing. This is a uh, electric vehicle charger. As you see, this is coming up into the uh, little charging thing. This uh, cable was what you, you know, you have the little holster here for the plug. And this is the copper cable that some crackhead or scavenger, a homeless person, whatever, cut, teenager, who knows, to get the copper. Okay. Um, I thought this was amusing. This is what you're going to see, right? Because you're going to go in these urban areas and put all these charging stations in. And these clowns are going to come in and cut all the cop. So what are you going to have to do? They're going to have to do like, uh, like you see in some urban areas where you see the uh, AC unit, the outside portion of the AC unit has to be elevated and they have it in a cage. So at the back of the building, up off the ground, so people can't come along and steal, you know, steal parts or steal the unit. And so is that what you're going to have to have on these? I don't know. I mean, how does this work if you can't access the, the, the cable and the, um, plug to plug into your vehicle i mean this is just another example of the stupidity out there so uh i, I don't know how you're going to fix this or maybe armored cable i don't know i don't know what you're going to do but i just thought it was humorous i found it amusing and uh you know well you know we're having copper shortage maybe the copper recycling from the from the recharging stations will be sufficient to be like a snake trying to eat itself i forget the name of that uh that the uh, mythological being it represents uh i don't I, I don't know but uh you know we're crackheads uh scavenge copper off of um of uh ev charging stations to help meet the copper deficit all right guys that's it for this week um again oil prices i think are going energy prices all across the board are probably going to be going higher um and we're positioned in the portfolio. The portfolio is doing well. Um, it's still beating the S&P. Uh, I don't know if, you know, again, it's not a one-way bet because one of the things, you know, if you red team this thing, you know, we should be thinking about what are the things that can derail the thesis. Well, like I said, if we have this tremendous deflationary depression in the United States or in the world economy or sufficient enough economic decline or pullback, yes, it will inevitably affect it. But, you know, do we have a Saudi put? It seems like we may. Are we going to move forward? Are the Europeans going to move forward with this price cap that Yellen was uh, suggesting? How much do the Russians take off? You know, we have the inner, inner, the ongoing decline in, uh, you know, world supply just from depletion that has to be replaced. And so, you know, all this stuff needs to be figured in. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think we're going to see, I think people are going to be shocked at what happens with energy prices over the next six months to a year. Uh, let me just say that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh,
good talking to you and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.